Hello everyone, welcome to Plague Spear and Company. This is week three of our uh, reading series. We're glad you joined us tonight and we will be starting with two gentlemen, the two gentlemen of Verona here shortly. Thanks for joining us tonight and hope you enjoy the reading. Cease to persuade my loving Proteus. Homekeeping youth have ever homely wits. Wert not affection chains thy tender days to the sweet glances of thy honored love. I rather would entreat thy company to see the wonders of the world abroad. Then, living dully sluggardized at home, wear out thy youth with shapeless idleness. But since thou lovest, love still and thrive therein, even as I would when I to love begin. Would thou be gone, sweet Valentine, to do with? Think on thy Proteus when thou doth happily see us some rare noteworthy object in thy travel. Wish me partaker in thy happiness when thou dost meet good hap, and in thy danger, if ever danger do environ thee, commend thy grievance to my holy prayers, for I will be thy beadsman, Val Valentine. <laughs> and on a love book, pray for my success? Upon some book I'll love, uh, uh, I love I, I'll pray for thee. That's on some shallow story of deep love, how young Leander crossed the Hellespont. That's a deep story of a deeper love, for he was more than over his shoes in love. Hmm, tis true, for you are over boots in love, and yet you never swam the Hellespont. Over the boots? Nay, give me not the boots. <laughs> no, I will not, for it boots thee not. What? To be in love! Where scorn is bought with groans, coy looks with heart sore sighs, one fading moment's mirth with twenty watchful, weary, tedious nights. If haply won, perhaps a hapless gain. If lost, why, <laughs> then a grievous labor won. However, but a folly bought with wit, or else a wit by folly vanquished. So by your circumstance, you call me a fool. <laughs> so by your circumstance, I fear you'll prove. It says love you cavail at, I am not love. Love is your master, for he masters you. And he that is so yoked by a fool, methinks should not be chronicled for wise. <laughs> Yet writers say, as in the sweetest bud, the eating canker dwells. So eating love inhabits in the finest wits of all. And writers say, as the most forward bud is eaten by the canker ere it blow, even so by love the young and tender wit is turned to folly, blasting in the bud, losing his verdure, even in the prime, and all the fair effects of future hopes. <laughs> but wherefore waste I time to counsel thee that art a votary to fond desire? Once more, adieu. My father at the road expects my coming there to see me shipped. And thither I will bring thee, Valentine. <laughs> Sweet Proteus, no. Now let us take our leave. To Milan, let me hear from thee by letters of thy success in love, and what news else betideth here in absence of thy friend. And I, likewise, will visit thee with mine. All happiness but chance of thee in Milan. As much to you at home. And so, farewell. Uh, he after honor hunts, I after love. He leaves his friends to dignify them more. I leave myself, my friends, and all for love. Thou, Julia, thou hast metamorphosed me, made me neglect my studies, lose my time, war with good counsel, and set the world at naught, made with musing weak, heart sick with thought. Well, Sir Proteus, bless you, saw you my master. Uh, but now he parted hence to embark for Milan. Oh, 20 to one then, he is shipped already, and I have played the sheep in losing him. Indeed, a sheep doth very often stray, and if the shepherd be a while away. You conclude that my master is a shepherd and I am a sheep? I do. <laughs> huh. Well, then my horns are his horns, whether I wake or sleep. <laughs> Silly answer, and fitting well a sheep. Well, this proves me still a sheep. A true, and thy master a shepherd. Nay, that I can deny by circumstance. It shall go hard, but I'll prove it by another. 
the shepherd seeks the sheep and not the sheep the shepherd. I'm, I seek my master, but my master seeks not me. Therefore, I am no sheep. Uh, the sheep for fodder follow the shepherd. The shepherd for food follows not the sheep. Thou for wages followest thy master. Thy master for wages follows not thee. Therefore, thou art the sheep. Such another proof will make me cry, bah. But dost thou hear? Gives thou my letter to Julia. I, sir, I, a lost mutton, gave your letter to her, a laced mutton, and she, a laced mutton, gave me, a lost mutton, nothing for my labor. Uh, here's too small a pasture for such a store of muttons. If the grounds be overcharged, you were best stick her. Nay, in that you are astray, in that you are astray, twere best pound you. No, sir, less than a pound shall serve me for carrying your letter. You mistake, I mean the pound, a pinfold. From a pound to a pin, folded over and over, tis threefold too little for carrying a letter to your love. But what said she? I. Nod I? <laughs> Why, that's a naughty. <laughs> you mistook, sir. I say she did nod, and you ask me if she did nod, and I say I. And set together is naughty. Now that you have taken the pains to set it together, take it for your pains. No, no, you shall have it for bearing the letter. Well, I must perceive I must be fain to bear with you. Why, sir, how do you bear with me? Mary, sir, the letter very orderly, having nothing but the word naughty for my pains. But shrew me, but you have a quick wit. And yet it cannot overtake your slow purse. Come, come, open the matter in brief. What said she? Open your purse, then the money and the matter shall be both at once delivered. Well, sir, here is for your pains. What said she? <sighs> Truly, sir, I think you, you'll hardly win her. Why? Couldst thou perceive so much from her? Sir, I could perceive nothing at all from her. No, not so much as a it for delivering your letter and being so hard to me that brought your mind, I fear she'll prove as hard to you in telling your mind. Give her no token but stones, for she's as hard as steel. So what said she? Nothing? Not so much as take this for your pains. <laughs> to testify your bounty, I thank you. You have tested me, and in requital whereof, henceforth, carry your letters yourself. And so, sir, I'll commend you to my master. Go, go, be gone to save your ship from wrack, which cannot perish having thee aboard, being destined to a drier death on shore. I must go send some better messenger. I fear my Julia would not deign my lines, receiving them from such a worthless post. But say, Lucetta, now we are alone, wouldst thou then counsel me to fall in love? Ay, madam, so you stumble not unheedfully. Of all the fair resort of gentlemen that every day with Parle encounter me, in thy opinion, which is worthiest love? Please you repeat their names. I'll show you my mind, according to my shallow, simple wit. Still. What thinkst thou of the fair Sir Eglamour? As of a knight, well spoken, neat, and fine, but were I you, he never should be mine. What thinkst thou of the rich Mercatio? Well, of his wealth, but of himself, so-so. Uh, what thinkst thou of the gentle Proteus? <laughs> Lord, Lord, to see what folly reigns in us. Oh, no. What means this passion at his name? Pardon, dear madam, tis a passing shame that I, unworthy body that I am, should censor thus on lovely gentlemen. Why not on Proteus, as of all the rest? Well, then thus, of many good, I think him best. Your reason? I have no other but a woman's reason. I think him so, because I think him so. And wouldst thou have me cast my love on him? Why, if you thought your love is not cast away? Why, he of all the rest hath never moved me. Yet he of all the rest I think best loves ye. 
His little speaking shows his love but small. Fire that's closest kept burns most of all. They do not love that do not show their love. Oh, they love least that let men know their love. Oh, I would, I knew his mind. Where is this paper, madam? To Julia. Say from whom? Um, that the contents will show. Say, say, who gave it thee? Sir Valentine's page, and sent, I think, from Proteus. He would have given it you, but I, being in the way, did in your name receive it. Pardon the fault, I pray. Now, by my modesty, a goodly broker, dare you presume to harbor wanton minds to whisper and conspire against my youth? Now, trust me, tis an office of great worth, and you an officer fit for the place. There. Take the paper, see it be returned, or else return no more into my sight. The plead your love deserves more than hate. Will ye be gone? That you may ruminate. And yet I would I had o'erlooked the letter. T'were shame to call her back again and pray her to a fault for which I chid her. What fool is she that knows I am a maid and would not force the letter to my view? Since maids in modesty say no to that which they would have the proffer construe I. Fie, fie, how wayward is this foolish love that like a testy babe will scratch the nurse and presently all humbled kiss the rod. How oh, churlishly I chid Lu Lucetta hence when willingly I would have had her here. How oh, angrily I taught my brow to frown when inward joy enforced my heart to smile. My penance is to call Lucetta back and ask remission for my folly past. What ho, Lucetta! What would your ladyship? Is near dinner time? I would it were. Then you might kill your stomach on your meat and not upon your maid. What is that you took up so gingerly? Nothing. Why didst thou stoop then? To take a paper up that I let fall. And is that paper nothing? Nothing concerning me. Then let it lie for those it that it concerns. Madam, it will not lie where it concerns unless it have a false interpreter. Some love of yours hath writ to you in rhyme. <laughs> that I might sing it, madam, to a tune. Give me a note. Your ladyship can set. As little by such toys as may be possible. Best sing it to the tune of light of love. Oh, it is too heavy for so light a tune. Heavy? Belike it hath some burden then? Ay, and melodious swore it. Would you sing it? And why not you? I cannot reach so high. Let's see your song. Oh, now, minion. Keep tune there still, so you will sing it out. And yet, methinks I do not like this tune. You do not? No, madam, tis too sharp. You, minion, are too saucy. Nay, no, you are too flat. And mar the conquered with too harsh a descant. There wanteth but a mean to fill your song. The mean is drowned with your unruly base. Indeed, I bid the base for Proteus. This babble shall not henceforth trouble me here. It's a coil with protestation. Go, get you gone, and let the papers lie. You will be fingering them to anger me. She makes it strange that she would be best pleased to be so angered with another letter. Nay, would I were so angered with the same. Oh, hateful hands to tear such loving words. Injurious wasps to feed on such sweet honey and kill the bees that yield it with your stings. I'll kiss each several paper for amends. <laughs> Look, <laughs> here is writ, kind Julia. Unkind Julia. 
As in revenge of thy ingratitude, I throw thy name against the bruising stones, trampling contemptuously on thy disdain. Oh, <laughs> and here is writ, love wounded Proteus. Oh, poor wounded name. <laughs> My bosom as a bed shall lodge thee till thy wound be throughly healed. <laughs> and thus I search it with a sovereign kiss. <laughs> but twice or thrice was Proteus written down. Oh, be calm, good queen, and blow not a word away until I have found each letter in the letter. Except mine own name, that some whirlwind bear unto a ragged, fearful hanging rock and throw it thence into the raging sea. Oh, lo, here in one line is his name twice writ. Poor forlorn Proteus, passionate Proteus, to the sweet Julia. Oh, that I'll tear away. And yet I will not. <laughs> Since so prettily he couples it to his complaining names. Thus will I fold them one upon another. <laughs> now kiss, embrace, contend, do what you will. Madam, dinner is ready and your father stays. Well, let us go. What? Shall these papers lie here like telltales here? If you respect them, best to take them up. Nay, I was taken up for laying them down. Yet here they shall not lie for catching cold. I see you have a month's mind them. Aye, madam, you may say what sights you see. I see things too, although you judge I wink. Come, come, wilt please you go. Tell me, Panthina, what sad talk was that wherewith my brother held you in the cloister? Was of his nephew Proteus, your son. Why, what of him? He wondered that your lordship would suffer him to spend his youth at home, while other men of slender reputation put forth their sons to seek preferment out, some to wars to try their fortune there, some to discover islands far away, some to the studious universities for any or for all these exercises. He said that Proteus, your son, was meet. And he did request me to importune you to let him spend his time no more at home, which would be great impeachment to his age, having no no travel in his youth. Nor needst thou much importune me to that, whereon this month have I been hammering. I have considered well his loss of time, and how he cannot be a perfect man, not being tried and tutored in the world. Experience is by industry achieved, and perfected by the swift course of time. And tell me, whither were I best to send him? I think your lordship is not ignorant how his companion, youthful Valentine, attends the emperor in his royal court. I know it well. For good, I think, your lordship sent him thither. There shall he practice tilts and tournaments, hear sweet discourse, converse with noblemen, and be in the eye of every exercise worthy his youth and nobleness of birth. I like thy counsel, well hast thou advised, and that thou mayest perceive how well I like it, the execution of it shall make known. Even with the speediest expedition I will dispatch him to the emperor's court. Tomorrow, may it please you, Don Alfonso, with other gentlemen of good esteem, are journeying to salute his emperor and to commend their service to his will. Good company. With them shall Proteus go. Ah, and in good time. Now will we break with him. <clears throat> sweet love, sweet line, sweet life. Here is her hand. Here is the agent of her heart. Here is her oath for love, her honor's pawn. Oh, that our fathers would applaud our loves to seal our happiness with her consent. Oh, heavenly Julia. How now? What letter are you reading there? Uh, may it please your lordship, tis a word or two of commendation sent from Valentine, uh, delivered by a friend that came from him. Lend me the letter, let me see what news. Uh, th there is no news, my lord, but that he writes how happily he lives, how well being loved uh, and daily graced by the emperor, wishing me with him partner of his fortune. And how stand you affected to his wish? As... One relying on your lordship's will and not depending on his friendly wish? My will is something sorted with his wish. Muse not that I thus suddenly proceed, for what I will, I will, and there an end. 
I am resolved that thou shalt spend some time with Valentinus in the emperor's court. What maintenance he from his friends receives, like exhibition thou shalt have from me. Tomorrow be in readiness to go. Excuse it not, for I am peremptory. My lord, I cannot be so soon be so soon provided. Please, you deliberate a day or two. Look, what thou wants shall be sent after thee. No more of stay. Tomorrow thou must go. Go on, Panthino. You shall be employed to hasten on his expedition. Thus have I shunned the fire for fear of burning and drenched me in the sea where I am drowned. I feared to show my father Julius' letter, lest he should take exception to my love. And with the vantage of my own excuse hath he expected most against my love. How the spring of love resembleth this uncertain glory of an April day, which now shows all the beauty of the sun, and by the cloud takes it all away. Sir Proteus, uh, your father calls. He is in haste, therefore I pray you, go. Why, this is it. My heart accords there too, and a thousand times it answers no. Sir, your glove. Not mine. My gloves are on. Why, this may be yours, for this is but one. Huh? Let me see. Aye, oh, give it me. It's mine. Oh, sweet ornament that decks a thing divine. Oh, Sylvia, Sylvia. Madam Sylvia, Madam Sylvia. Uh, how now, sirrah? She is not within hearing, sir. <laughs> Why, sir, who bade you call her? Well, your worship, sir, or else I mistook. Well, <laughs> You'll still be too forward. And yet I was last chidden for being too slow. Go to, sir. Tell me, do you know Madam Sylvia? She your worship loves. <laughs> Why, how know you that I'm in love? Mary, by these special marks. First, you have learned like Sir Proteus to wreathe your arms like a malcontent, to relish a love song like a robin redbreast, to walk alone like one that had the pestilence, to sigh like a schoolboy that had lost ABCs, to weep like a young wench that had buried her grandmom, to fast like one that takes to diet, to watch like one that fears robbing, to speak puling like a beggar at Hallowmas. You were wont when you laughed to crow like a cock, when you walked to walk like one of the lions, when you fasted, it was presently after dinner. When you looked sadly, it was for want of money. And now you are metamorphosed with a mistress that when I look on you, I can hardly think you my master. Are all these things perceived in me? They are all perceived without you. Without me? They cannot. Without you? Nay, that's certain. For without you were so simple, none else would. But you are so without these follies that these follies are within you and shine through you like the water in a urinal, that not an eye that sees you but is positioned to comment on your malady. But tell me, dost thou know my lady Sylvia? Oh, she that you gaze on so as she sits at supper. <laughs> Hast thou observed that? Even she, I mean. Why, sir, I know her not. Dost thou know her by my gazing on her, and yet knowst her not? Is she not hard-favored, sir? Not so fair, boy, as well-favored. Sir, I know that well enough. What dost thou know? That she is not so fair as of you well-favored. <laughs> I mean that her beauty is exquisite, but her favor infinite. That is because one is painted and the other out of all count. How painted and how out of count? Mary, sir, so painted to make her fair, but no man counts her beauty. <laughs> how esteemest thou me? I account of her beauty. Oh, you never saw her since she was deformed. How long has she been deformed? Ever since you loved her. <laughs> I have loved her ever since I saw her, and still I see her beautiful. If you love her, you cannot see her. Why? Because love is blind. <sighs> oh, that you had mine eyes, or your own eyes had the lights they were wont to have when you chid at Sir Proteus for going unguarded. What should I see then? Your own present folly and her passing deformity. For he being in love could not see to garter his hose, and you being in love cannot see to put on your hose. <laughs> Belike, boy, then you are in love. 
for last morning, you could not see to wipe my shoes. True, sir. I was in love with my bed. I thank you, you swinged me for my love, which makes me the bolder to chide you for yours. In conclusion, I stand affected to her. Oh, I wish you were set so your affections would cease. Last night she enjoined me to write some lines to one she loves. And have you? I have. Are they not lamely writ? No, boy, but as well as I can do them. Oh, peace. Here she comes. Oh, excellent motion. Oh, exceeding puppet. Now will he interpret to her. <laughs> Madam and mistress, a thousand good morrows. Oh, give ye good even. There's a million of manners. Oh, Sir Valentine and servant, to you two thousand. <laughs> He should give her interest and she gives it to him. As you enjoined me, I have writ your letter unto the secret nameless friend of yours, which I was much unwilling to proceed in, but for my duty to your ladyship. Oh, thank you, gentle servant. Tis very clerkly done. Now, trust me, madam, it, it came hardly off f for being ignorance to whom it goes, I writ at random, very doubtfully. Perhaps you think too much of so much pains? No, madam. <laughs> so instead you, I, I will write, please, you command a thousand times as much. And, oh, pretty yet, period. Uh, well, I guess the sequel. And yet I will not name it. Well, and yet I care not. And yet take this again. And yet I thank you, meaning henceforth to trouble you no more. And yet you will, and yet another yet. What means your ladyship? Do, do you not like it? Mm. Yes, yes, the lines are very quaintly writ, but since unwillingly, oh, take them again, nay, take them. Madam, they are for you. I, I, you writ them, sir, at my request, but I will have none of them. <laughs> they are for you. <laughs> I would have writ more movingly. <laughs> please you, I'll, I'll write your ladyship another. And then it's writ for my sake, read it over. And if it please you so, uh, if, if so, why? So. If, if, if it please me, madam, what then? Why, if it please you, take it for your labor. And so, good morrow, servant. <laughs> oh, just unseen, inscrutable, invisible as a nose on a man's face or a weathercock on a steeple. My master sues to her and she hath taught her suitor, he being her pupil, to become her tutor. Oh, excellent device. Was there ever heard a better that my master being scribe to himself should write the letter? <laughs> How now, sir? What are you reasoning with yourself? Nay, I was rhyming. Tis you that have the reason. To do what? To be a spokesman for Madame Sylvia. To whom? To yourself. Why, she woos you by a figure. What figure? Well, by a letter, I should say. Why? She hath not writ to me. What need she when she hath made you write to yourself? Oh, why do you not perceive the jest? No, believe me. Oh, no believing you indeed, sir. But do you perceive her earnest? She gave me none, except an angry word. Oh, why, she hath given you a letter. Well, that's the letter I writ to her friend. And that letter hath she delivered, and that's an end. Oh, oh I would it were no worse. <laughs> oh, warrant you, tis as well. For often have you writ to her, and she, in modesty, or else for want of idle time, could not again reply, or, fearing else some messenger that might her mind discover, herself 
hath taught her love himself to write unto her lover. <laughs> As I speak in print for in print, I found it. What muse you, sir? Oh, tis dinner time. I have dined. I but hearken, sir, though the chameleon love can feed on the air, I am one that am nursed by my victuals and would fain have meat. Oh, be not like our mistress. Be moved. Be moved. Have patience, gentle Julia. I must where there is no remedy. When I possibly can, I will return. If you turn not, you will return the sooner. Keep this remembrance for thy Julia's sake. And why well, then we'll make exchange here. Uh, take you this. And seal the bargain with a holy kiss. Uh, Tis, here's my hand for my true company. Uh, when, uh, and when that hour slips me the day wherein I sigh not Julia for thy sake, the next ensu ensuing hour some foul mischance torment me for thy love's forgetfulness. My father stays my coming, a answer not. The tide is now, nay, the, not the tide of tears, the, 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 that tide will save me longer than I should. Julia, farewell. <laughs> what, gone without a word? I so true love should do it, cannot speak, for truth hath better deeds than words to grace it. Go, I come, I come, alas, this parting strikes poor lovers dumb. Nay! Nay! It will be this hour ere I have done weeping. All the kind of the Launces have this very fault. I have received my proportion, and like the prodigious son, and am going with Sir Proteus to the Imperial's court. I think Crab, my dog, hey, say hi. Yeah, be the sourest natured dog that lives. My mother, she's weeping. My father, wailing. My sister, crying. Our maid, howling. Our, our cat, wringing her hands in all of our house in a great perplexity. Yet did not this cruel-hearted cur shed one tear, huh? Not one single tear. Stone, very pebble stone, and has no more pity in him than a, than a, well, than a, than a dog. Why, my, my granddam, having no eyes, look, you wept herself blind at my parting. Oh, nay. Oh, thank you. Shake. I'll show you the manner of it. Here. This shoe. Ah. This shoe is my father. No. This left shoe is my father. No, this left shoe is my mother. Hey, that cannot be so nice. Yes, yes. <laughs> it is so. It hath the worse a soul. <laughs> the shoe with the hole in it uh, is my mother. <laughs> and this my father. Vengeance on it. There it is. Now, uh, okay. So uh, this staff. Here, the staff here is my sister, for look you, she's as white as a lily and as small as a wand. <laughs> and uh, oh, this hat is Nan, our maid, and I am the dog. No, the dog is himself, sit, and I am the dog. No, the dog is me and I am myself. So, 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 now come I to my father. <clears throat> father, hello, your blessing. <laughs> now should not the shoe speak a word for weeping. <laughs> well, I kiss my father. <laughs> he weeps on. Now come I to my mother. Oh, that she could speak now like a wood woman. <laughs> well, I kiss my mother. There it is. There's my mother sent up and down. <laughs> now come I to my sister. Yeah, mark the moan she makes. 
Now the dog, all this while, sheds not a tear, nor speaks not a word. Yet see how I lay the dust with my tears. Dance! Walk away! Away aboard! Thy master is shipped, and thou art to post after with oars? What's the matter? Why weepest thou, man? Away, ass! You'll lose the tide if you tarry any longer. It is no matter if the tide were lost, for it is the unkindest tide that ever any man tied. What's the unkindest tide? Why, he that's tied here, crab, my dog. What, man? I mean thou losest the flood. And in losing the flood, thou, thou losest the voyage. And in losing thy voyage, thou losest thy master. And in losing thy master, thou losest the service. And in losing service... <laughs> Why dost thou stop my mouth? For fear thou should lose thy tongue. Where should I lose my tongue? In thy tail. Oh, in thy tail. Ooh. <laughs> Lose the tide and the voyage and the master and the service and the tide. Why, man, if the river were dry, I am able to fill it with my tears. If the wind were down, I could drive a boat with my sighs. Come, come away, man. I was sent to call thee. Oh, sir, you call me what thou darest. Will thou go? Yeah, well, I will go. Servant. Mistress. Master, Sir Thurio frowns on you. Aye, boy, it's for love. Not of you. Of my mistress, then. Twere good you knocked him. Servant, you are sad. Indeed, madam, I seem so. Seem you that you are not? Haply, I do. So do counterfeits. So do you. What seem I that I am not? Wise. What instance of the contrary? Your folly? And how quote you my folly? I quote it in your jerkin. <laughs> <laughs> my jerkin is a doublet. Well then, I'll double your folly. How? Oh, <laughs> what? Angry, Sir Thurio? Do you change color? <laughs> Give him leave, madam. He is a... Kind of chameleon. <laughs> that hath more mind to feed on your blood than live on in your air. <laughs> you have said, sir. Aye, sir, and done too for this time. I know it well, sir. You always end ere you begin. Oh, a fine volley of words, gentlemen, and quickly shut off. <laughs> Tis indeed, madam. We thank the giver. Who is that servant? Yourself. Sweet lady, for you gave the fire. Sir Thurio borrows his wit from your ladyship's looks and spends what he borrows kindly in your company. Sir, if you spend word for word with me, I shall make your wit bankrupt. <laughs> I know it well, sir. You have an exchequer of words and I think no other treasure to give your followers. For it appears by their bare liveries that they live by your bare words. No, no more, gentlemen, no more. Here comes my father. Now, daughter, Sylvia, you are hard beset. Sir Valentine, your father is in good health. What say you to a letter from your friends of much good news? My lord, I will be thankful to any happy messenger from thence. Know ye, Don Antonio, your countryman. Aye, my good lord, I know the gentleman to be of worth and worthy estimation, and not without desert, so well reputed. Hath he not a son? Aye, my good lord, a son that well deserves the honor and regard of such a father. Oh, you know him well. <laughs> I knew him as myself, for from our infancy we have conversed and spent our hours together, 
And though myself have been in idle truant, omitting the sweet benefit of time to clothe mine age with angel-like perfection, yet hath Sir Proteus, for that's his name, made use and fair advantage of his days. His years but young, but his experience old, his head unmellowed, but his judgment ripe. And in a word, for far behind his worth comes all the praises that I now bestow. He is complete in feature and in mind with all good grace to grace a gentleman. Beshrew me, sir, but if he make this good, he is as worthy for an empress love as meet to be an emperor's counselor. Well, sir, this gentleman is come to me with commendation from great potentates, and here he means to spend his time a while. I think tis no unwelcome news to you. Should I have wished a thing, it had been he. Welcome him, then, according to his worth. Sylvia, I speak to you, and you, Sir Thurio. For Valentine, I need not cite him to it. I will send him hither to you presently. This is the gentleman I told your ladyship uh, had come along with me, but that his mistress did hold his eyes locked in her crystal looks. Be like that now she hath enfranchised them upon some pawn for fealty. <laughs> Nay, sure. I think she holds them prisoners still. Nay, then he should be blind, and being blind, how could he see his way to seek you out? My lady, love hath twenty pair of eyes. They say that love hath not an eye at all. All. To see such lovers, Thurio, as yourself, upon a homely object, love can wink. Oh, have done, have done. Here comes the gentleman. Welcome, dear Proteus. Mistress, I beseech you, confirm his welcome with some special favor. Oh, his worth is warrant for his welcome hither. And if this be you, have oft wished to hear from. Mistress, it is. Sweet lady entertain him to be my fellow servant to your ladyship. Oh, too low a mistress for so high a servant. Not so, sweet lady, but too mean a servant to have look of such uh, to have, ha have a look of such a worthy mistress. Leave off discourse of disability, <laughs> sweet lady. Entertain him for your servant. My duty I will boast of, nothing else. And duty never did want his mood. Servant, you are welcome to a worthless mistress. I'll die on him that says so, but yourself. That you are welcome? That you are worthless. <laughs> Adam, my lord, your father would speak with you. Oh, I wait upon his pleasure. Come, Sir Thurio, go with me. Once more, new servant welcome. I'll leave you to confer of home affairs. When you have done, we look to hear from you. We both attend upon your ladyship. Now tell me, how do all from whence you came? Your friends are well and have them much commended. And how do yours? I left them all in health. How does your lady? <laughs> and how thrives your love? My tales of love were wont to weary you. I know you joy not in love discourse. Aye, Proteus, but that life is altered now. I have done penance for condemning love, whose high imperious thoughts have punished me with bitter fasts, with penitential groans, with nightly tears, and daily heart sore sighs. For in revenge of my contempt of love, love hath chased sleep from my enthralled eyes and made them watchers of mine own heart's sorrow. Oh, gentle Proteus, love's a mighty lord, and hath so humbled me as I confess there is no woe to his correction, nor to his service, no such joy on earth. Now, no discourse, except it be of love. Now can I break my fast, dine, sup, and sleep upon the very naked name of love. Enough. I read your fortune in your eye. Was this the idol that you worship so? <laughs> Even she... And is she not a heavenly saint? No, but she is an earthly paragon. Call her divine. I, I will not flatter her. Oh, flatter me, for love delights in praises. When I was sick, you gave me bitter pills, and I must minister the like to you. Then speak the truth by her. If not divine, yet let her be a uh, principality, sovereign to all the creatures on the earth. Except my mistress. Sweet, except not any. 
except thou wilt accept against my love. Have I not reason to prefer mine own? And I will help thee to prefer her too. She shall be dignified with this high honor to bear my lady's train, lest the base earth should from her vesture chance to steal a kiss, and, and of so great a favor growing proud, disdain to root the summer smelling flower and make rough winter everlastingly. Why, Valentine, what braggadism is this? Pardon me, Proteus. <laughs> All I can is nothing to her, whose worth makes other worthies nothing. She is alone. Then let her alone. Not for the world. Why, man, she is mine own, and I is rich for having such a jewel as twenty seas. If all their sand were pearl, the water nectar, and the rocks pure gold. <sighs> Forgive me that I do not dream on thee, because thou seest me dote upon my love. <laughs> My foolish rival, that her father likes, only for his possessions are so huge, is gone with her along. And I must after, for love, thou knowest, is full of jealousy. But she loves you. <clears throat> I, and we are betrothed. Huh? <laughs> Nay more, our marriage hour, with all the cunning manner of our flight determined of, how I must climb her window, the ladder made of cords, and all the means plotted and greed on for my happiness. Good Proteus, go with me to my chamber in these affairs to aid me with thy counsel. Go on before. I shall inquire you forth. I must unto the road to disembark some necessaries that I need must use, and then presently I'll attend you. Will you make haste? I will. Even as one heat expels another, or as one nail by strength drives out another, so the remembrance of my former love is by a newer object quite forgotten. Is it mine eye or is Valentinus' praise her true perfection, or my false transgression that makes me reasonless to reason thus? She is fair, and, and so is Julia that I love, that I did love, for now my love is thawed, which like some waxen image against a fire bears no impression of the thing that it was. Methinks my zeal to Valentine is cold and that I love him not as I want. But I love this lady too much and that's the reason I love him so little. How shall I dote on her with more advice than thus without advice begin to love her? Tis but a picture I've yet beheld and that hath dazzled my reason's light. When I look upon her perfections, there's no reason, but I shall be blind. If I can check my erring love, I will. If not, to compass her, I'll use my skill. Lance, oh. by mine honesty, welcome to Milan. Oh, forswear not thyself, sweet youth, for I am not welcome. I reckon this always, that a man is never undone till he be hanged, nor never welcome to a place till some certain shot be paid, and the hostess say, welcome. Oh, come on, you madcap. I'll to the alehouse with you presently, where oh. for one shot of five pence thou shalt have five thousand welcomes. Oh. But, Sira, how did thy master part with Madame Julia? Uh, Mary, after they closed in earnest, they uh, parted very fairly in jest. What, shall she marry him? No. How then, shall he marry her? No, neither. What, are they broken? No, they are both as whole as fish. Why then, how stands the matter with them? Marry, thus, when it, <laughs> when it stands well with him, it stands well with her. <laughs> what an ass thou art. I understand thee not. What a block art thou that thou canst not. My uh, staff understands me. What thou sayest? Ah, yeah, and what I do too, hey? Here, yeah, look, look you, huh? All but lean, and my staff understands me. It stands under thee, indeed. Yeah, why stand under, understand, it's all one. Oh, but tell me true, will it be a match? Uh, all right, ask my dog. Yeah. Hey, if he say I, it will. If he say no, it will. 
if he shake his tail and say nothing, it will. <laughs> the conclusion is then that it will. Oop, thou shall never get such a secret from me, but by a parable. <laughs> ah, tis well that I get it so. But not, how sayest thou that my master is become a notable lover? I never knew him otherwise. Then how? A notable lover, as thou reportest him to be. Why, thou horse on ass, thou mistakes me. Why, fool, I meant not thee, I meant thy master. I tell thee, my master is become a hot lover. Why, I tell thee, I care not, though he burn himself in love. Wilt thou go, huh? Let's, let's drink. At thy service. Ah. To leave my Julia, shall I be forsworn? To love fair Sylvia, shall I be forsworn? To wrong my friend, I shall be much forsworn. And even the power which gave me first my oath provokes me this to threefold perjury. Love bade me swear, and love bides me, bids me forswear. Sweet suggesting love, if thou hast sinned, teach me thy tempted subject to excuse it. At first, you know, I did adore a twinkling star. But now I worship a celestial sun. Unheedful vows may heedfully be broken, and he wit that once resolved to learn his wit exchanged a bad for better. If I, if I uh, unreserved tongue to call her bad, whose sovereignty so oft thou hath preferred, with 20,000 soul confirming oaths, I cannot leave to love, and yet I, I do. But there I leave to love where I should love. Julia I lose and Valentine I lose. If I keep them, I needs must lose myself. If I lose them, thus find I by their loss for Valentine myself, for Julia Sylvia. I to myself am, a dear, am, am dearer than a friend for love is still most precious in itself. And Sylvia, witness heaven that made her fair, shows Julia but a swarthy Ethiop. I will forget that Julia's alive, remembering that my love to her is dead. And Valentine, a hold enemy, aiming at Sylvia as a sweeter friend. I cannot now prove constant to myself without some treachery used to Valentine. This night, he meaneth uh, with a corded ladder to climb celestial Sylvia's chamber window, myself and counsel his competitor. Now presently, I'll give her father notice of the disgusting and pretending flight, who all enraged will banish Valentine. For Thurio, he intends shall be wed by his daughter. But Valentine being gone, I'll quickly cross by some sly trick blunt Thurio's dull proceedings. Love, lend me wings to make my purpose swift, as thou hast let me wit to plot this drift. <laughs> Counsel, Lucetta, gentle girl, assist me, and even in kind love I do conjure thee, who art the table wherein all my thoughts are visibly character charactered and engraved, to lessen me and tell me some good mean, how with my honor I may undertake a journey to my loving Proteus. Alas? The way is wearisome and long. Oh, a true devoted pilgrim is not weary to measure kingdoms with his feeble steps. Much less shall she that hath love's wings to fly, and when the flight is made to one so dear of such divine perfection as Sir Proteus. <laughs> Better forbear till Proteus make return. Oh, knowest thou not his looks are my soul's food? Pity the dearth that I have pined in by longing for that food so long a time. Didst thou but know the inly touch of love, thou wouldst as soon go kindle fire with snow as seek to quench the fire of love with words. I do not seek to quench your love's hot fire, but qualify the fire's extreme rage, lest it should burn above the bounds of reason. 
The more thou damnst it up, the more it burns. The current that with gentle murmur glides, thou knowst, being stopped, impatiently doth rage. But when his fair course is not hindered, he makes sweet music with the enameled stones, giving a gentle kiss to every sedge he overtaketh in his pilgrimage. And so, by many winding nooks, he strays with willing sport to the wild ocean. Let me go and hinder not my course. I'll be as patient as a gentle stream and make a pastime of each weary step till the last step have brought me to my love and there i'll rest as after much turmoil a blessed soul doth in elysium but in what habit will you go along oh not like a woman <laughs> for i would prevent the loose encounters of lascivious men gentle lucetta Fit me with such weeds as may beseem some well-reputed page. Why then, your ladyship must cut your hair. No, girl, I'll knit it up in silken strings with uh, twenty odd conceited true love knots to be fantastic may become a youth of greater time than I shall show to be. Uh, what fashion, madam, shall I make your breeches? Fits as well as, tell me, good my lord, what compass will you wear your farthingale? <laughs> Why, even what fashion thou likes best, Lucetta? Thou must needs uh, have them uh, with a codpiece, madam. Out, out, Lucetta, that will be ill-favored. A round hose, madam, now's not worth a pin, unless you have a codpiece to uh, stick pins in. Um. Lucetta, is thou lovest me, let me have what thou think'st meet and is most mannerly. But tell me, wench, how will the world repute me for undertaking so instead a journey? I fear me it will make me scandalized. If you think so, then stay at home and go not. Nay, that I will not. Then never dream on infamy, but go. If Proteus like your journey, when you come, no matter who's displeased when you are gone, I fear me he will scarce be pleased with all. That is the least Lucetta of my fear. A thousand oaths, an ocean of his tears, and instances of infinite love warrant me welcome to my Proteus. All these are servants of deceitful men. Base men that use them to so base effect. But truer stars did govern Proteus' birth. His words are bonds, his oaths are oracles, his love sincere, his thoughts immaculate, his tears pure messengers sent from his heart, his heart as far from fraud as heaven from earth. <laughs> Pray heaven, he proves so when you come to him. Now, as thou lovest me, do him not that wrong to bear a hard opinion of his truth. Only deserve my love by loving him, and presently go with me to my chamber to take note of what I stand in need of to furnish me upon my longing journey. All that is mine I leave at thy dispose, my goods, my lands, my reputation. Only in lieu thereof, dispatch me hence. Come, answer not, but to it presently. <laughs> I am impatient of my tarriance. Petherio. Give us leave, I pray, a while. We have some secrets to confer about. I don't even know why. Shut up, all right. Well, let's get out of here. Right. Now, tell me, Proteus, what's your will with me? My gracious lord, that which I would discover the law of friendship bids me to conceal. But when I call to mind your gracious favors done to me, undeserving as I am, my duty pricks me to the un on to utter that which no which else no worldly good should draw from me. No worthy prince, Sir Valentine, my friend, this knight intends to steal away your daughter. Myself am the one made privy to the plot. I know you have determined to bestow her on Thurio, whom your gentle daughter hates. And should she thus be stolen away from you, it would much vexation to your it would it would be much vexation to your age. Thus, for my duty's sake. I rather choose to cross my friend in his intended drift than by concealing it. Heap on your head a pack of sorrows which would press you down, being unprevented to your timeless grave. Proteus, 
I thank thee for thy honest care, which to requite command me while I live. This love of theirs myself have often seen, haply when they have judged me fast asleep, and oftentimes have purposed to forbid Sir Valentine her company and my court. But fearing lest my jealous aim might err, and so unworthily disgrace the man, rashness that I ever yet have shunned, I gave him gentle looks, thereby to find that which thyself hast now disclosed to me. And that thou mayst perceive my fear of this, knowing that tender youth is soon suggested, I nightly lodge her in an upper tower, the key whereof myself have ever kept, and thence she cannot be conveyed away. No, noble lord, that they have devised a mean how he, her chamber window will ascend and with a corded ladder fetch her down, for which the youthful lover now is gone and this way comes he with, with presently, where if it please you, you may intercept him. But good my lord, do so cunningly that my discovery he, he be not aimed at for love of you, not hate unto my friend hath made me publisher of this pretense. Upon mine honor, he shall never know that I had any light from thee of this. I do my lord, uh, Sir Valentine is coming. Sir Valentine, whither away so fast? Please be your grace. There is a messenger that stays to bear my letters to my friends, and I am going to deliver them. Be they of much import? The tenure of them doth but signify my health and happy being at your court. Nay, then, no matter. Stay with me a while. I am to break with thee of some affairs that, that touch me near, wherein... Thou must be secret. Tis not unknown to thee that I have sought to match my friend Sir Thurio to my daughter. I know it well, my lord. And sure, the match were rich and honorable. Besides, the gentleman is full of virtue, bounty, worth, and qualities beseeming such a wife as your fair daughter. Cannot your grace win her to fancy him? No, trust me, she is peevish, sullen, froward, proud, disobedient, stubborn, lacking duty, neither regarding that she is my child, nor fearing me as if I were her father. And may I say to thee, this pride of hers, upon advice, hath drawn my love from her. And where I thought the remnant of mine age should have been cherished by her childlike duty, I now am full resolved to take a wife and turn her out to who will take her in. Then let her beauty be her wedding dower, for me in my possession she esteemeth not. What would your grace have me to do in this? Well, <laughs> there is a lady in Milano here whom I affect, <laughs> but she is nice and coy and, and not esteems my aged eloquence. <laughs> Now, therefore, would I have thee to my tutor, for long agone I have forgot to court. Besides, the fashion of the time is changed. How and which way I may bestow myself to be regarded in her sun-bright eyes. <laughs> Win her with gifts, if she respect not words. Dumb jewels, often in their silent kind, more than quick words do move a woman's mind. Oh, but she did scorn a present that I sent her. A woman sometimes scorns what best contents her. Send her another, never give her o'er, for scorn at first makes after love the more. If she do frown, tis not in hate of you, but rather to beget more love in you. If she do chide, tis not to have you gone, for why, <laughs> the fools are mad if left alone. Take no repulse, whatever she doth say, for get you gone, she doth not mean away. Flatter and praise, commend, extol their graces. Though ne'er so black, say they have angels' faces. That man that hath a tongue, I say, is no man, if with his tongue he cannot win a woman. Hmm. But she, I mean, is promised by her friends unto a youthful gentleman of worth, and kept severely from resort of men, and that no man hath access by day to her. Why, then, I would resort to her by night. Well, aye, but the doors be locked, 
and keys kept safe, that no man hath recourse to her by night. What lets but one may enter at her window? Well, her chamber is a lot far, far from the ground, and built so shelving that one cannot climb it without apparent hazard of his life. Why then, a ladder, quaintly made of cords to cast up with a pair of anchoring hooks, would serve to scale another hero's tower. So bold, Leander would adventure it. Now, as thou art a gentleman of blood, advise me where I may have such a ladder. <laughs> when would you use it? Pray, sir, tell me that. Well, this very night, for love is like a child that longs for everything that he can come by. <laughs> by uh, seven o'clock, I'll get you such a ladder. Oh, but hark thee, I, I will go to her alone. How shall I best convey the ladder thither? It will be light, my lord, that you may bear it under a cloak that is of any length. A cloak as long as thine will serve the turn. Uh, I, my good lord? Well, then let me see thy cloak. I, I'll <laughs> get me one of such another length. Why, any cloak will serve the turn, my lord. How shall I fashion me to wear a cloak? I pray thee, let me feel thy cloak upon me. What letter is this same? What, what's here? <laughs> Sylvia. Uh, hmm. yes. <laughs> and uh, here an engine fit for my proceeding. I'll be so bold to break the seal for once. You don't have to. Mm. Mm. My thoughts do harbor with my Sylvia nightly, and slaves they are to me that send them <sighs> flying. Oh. Oh, could their master come and go as lightly, himself would lodge where senseless they are lying. My herald thoughts in thy pure bosom rest them, while I, their king, that thither them importune, do curse the grace that with such grace hath blessed them, because myself do want my servant's fortune. I curse myself, for they are sent by me, that they should harbor where their lord should be. Huh. Oh, what's here? Sylvia, this night I will enfranchise thee. Oh, tis so, oh, tis so, and, and here's the ladder for the purpose. Why, Phaeton, for thou art Merop's son, wilt thou aspire to guide the heavenly car and with thy daring folly burn the world? Wilt thou reach stars because they shine on thee? Go! Base intruder, overweening slave, bestow thy fawning smiles on equal mates, and think my patience more than thy desert is privilege for thy departure hence. Thank me for this more than for all the favors which all too much I have bestowed on thee. But if thou linger in my territories longer than swiftest expedition, will give thee time to leave our royal court by heaven. My wrath shall far exceed the love I ever bore my daughter or thyself. Be gone. I will not hear thy vain excuse, but as thou lovest thy life, make speed from hence. And why not death rather than living torment? To die is to be banished from myself. And Sylvia, is myself. Banished from her is self from self, a deadly banishment. What joy is joy if Sylvia be not seen? What light is light if Sylvia be not by? Unless it be to think that she is by and feed upon the shadow of perfection. Except I be by Sylvia in the night, there is no music in the nightingale. Unless I look on Sylvia in the day, there is no day for me to look upon. She is my essence, and I leave to be if I be not by her fair influence. Fostered, illumined, cherished, kept alive. I fly not death to fly his deadly doom. And tarry I here, I but attend on death. 
but fly I hence. I fly away from life. Run, boy. Run. Run and seek him out. So ho! So ho! What seest thou? Well, Jim, we go to find. There's not a hair on head, but tis a valentine. Valentine? No. no. Who then? His spirit? Neither. What then? Nothing. Can nothing speak? Master, shall I strike? Wouldst thou strike? Nothing. Villain forbear. Why, sir, I'll strike nothing, I pray you. Sirrah, I said forbear. Friend Valentine, a word. My ears are stopped and cannot hear good news. So much of bad hath already possessed them. Then in dumb silence I will bury mine, for they are harsh, untenable, and bad. Is Sylvia dead? No, Valentine. No, Valentine, indeed. For sacred Sylvia. Hath she forsworn me? No, Valentine. No, Valentine, if Sylvia hath forsworn me. What is your news? Sir, Sir. there is a proclamation that you are vanished. That thou art banished. Oh, that's the news from hence, from Sylvia and from me, thy friend. Uh, oh, I have fed upon this woe already, and now excess of it will make me surfeit. Doth Sylvia know that I am banished? Aye, aye. And she hath offered to the doom, which unreserved stands in effectual force, the sea of melting pearl, which some call tears. Those at her father's churlish feet she tendered, with them upon her knees, her humble self wringing her hands, whose whiteness so became them, as if but now they were waxed pale for woe. But neither bended knee, pure hands held up, sad sighs, deep groans, no silver shedding tears could penetrate her uncompassionate sire. Valentine, if he be uh, taken, he must die. Besides, her intercession chafed him so, when she, when she for thy reply was suppliant, that to close a, a prison, that she, he commanded her with many bitter threats of biding there. No more, unless the next word that thou speakest have some malignant power upon my life. If so, I pray thee, breathe it in mine ear, as ending anthem of my endless dolor. Cease to lament, for thou canst not help, and study help for that which thou laments. Time is the nurse and breeder of all good. Here if thou stay, thou cannot see thy love. Besides, thy staying will abridge thy life. Hope is a lover's staff. Walk hence with that, and manage it with against, with against despairing thoughts. Thy letters may be here, though thou art hence, which being writ to me shall be delivered, even in the milk-white bosom of thy love. The time now serves not to ex expostulate. Come, I'll convey thee through the city gate. And ere I part with thee, confer it a large of all that may concern of thy love affairs. And as thou lovest Sylvia, though not for thyself, regard thy danger and along with me. I pray thee, Launce, and if thou seest my boy, bid him make haste and meet me at the north gate. Go, Sirrah, find him out. Come, Valentine. Oh, my dear Sylvia, hapless Valentine. I am but a fool, look you, and yet I have the wit to think my master is a kind of a knave. <laughs> but that's all one, if he be but one knave. He lives not now that knows me to be in love. Yet I am in love. <laughs> but a team of horse shall not pluck from me, that is who, I, who tis I love. Yet it tis a woman. <laughs> But what woman, I will not tell myself. And yet she tis a, tis a milkmaid. Yet tis not a maid, for she hath had gossips. <laughs> yet tis a maid, for she is her master's maid, and she serves for wages. She hath more qualities than a water spaniel, which is much in a bare Christian. Oh, here is the Kate log of her condition. Oops. <clears throat> Imprimis, she can fetch and carry <laughs> why a horse can do no more. 
Wait, a, 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 horse, a horse cannot fetch but only carry. Therefore, she is better than a jade. <laughs> <clears throat> Item, she can milk. Look you, that is a, a, a sweet virtue in a maid with clean hands. <laughs> oh no, Signor Lanz, what news with your mastership? With my master's ship? Why, it's at sea. Will your old vice still mistake the word? <laughs> what news then in your paper? Oh, the blackest news that ever thou heardst. Why, man, how black? Why, it's as black as uh, ink. Well, let me read it then. <laughs> Fie on thee, Joel Ted. Thou canst not read. Thou liest, I can. All right. I will try thee. Tell me, tell me this. Who begot thee? Mary, the son of my grandfather. Oh, you illiterate loiterer. It was the son of thy grandmother. This proves thou canst not read. <laughs> oh, oh, come, try me in thy paper. Right there. And St. Nicholas be thy speed. <clears throat> in primus, she can milk. I bet she can. <laughs> Item, she brews good ale. And thereof comes the proverb, blessing of your hearts, you brew good ale. Item, she can sew. Hmm, that's as much as to say, can she sew? Eh. Item, she can knit. What need a man care for a stock with a wench when she can knit him a stock? <laughs> Item, she can wash and scour. Oh, that's a special virtue, for then she need not be washed and scoured. <laughs> Item, she can spin. Hmm. That I may set the world on wheels where she can spin for her living. Item, she hath many nameless virtues. Well, now, that, that's as much as to say bastard virtues that indeed know not their fathers and therefore have no names. So... Here follows her vices. Ah, close at the heels of her virtues. Huh? I think she is not to be kissed fasting in respect of her breath. Uh, well, that fault may be mended with a breakfast, so read on. Item, she hath a sweet mouth. Ah, see, that makes amends for her sour breath. <laughs> Item, she doth talk in her sleep. Well, that's no matter for that, so she not sleep in her talk. <laughs> Item, she is slow in words. Oh, villain that set this down among her vices. To be slow in words is a woman's only virtue. I pray thee out with that and place it for her chief virtue. Item, she is proud. Yeah, out with that too. It was Eve's legacy and cannot be tamed from her. Item, she hath no teeth. I care not for that neither, because, uh, because I love crusts. Item, she is cursed. Well, the best is she hath no teeth to bite, huh? <laughs> Item, she will often praise her liquor. Well, hell, if her liquor be good, she shall. And if she will not, then I will, for good things should be praised, eh? Item, she is too liberal. Well, of her tongue she cannot, for that's right down she's slow of. Of a purse she shall not, for that I'll keep shut. Now, of another thing she may be, and, uh, well, that I, I cannot help. <laughs> well, proceed. <clears throat> Item. She hath more hair than wit, and more faults than hairs, and more wealth than faults. Stop there. I will have her. She was mine and not mine twice or thrice in that last article. Rehearse that again. Item. She hath more hair than wit. More hair than wit? It may be. I'll prove it. The cover of the salt hides the salt, and therefore it is more than the salt. The hair that covers the wit is more than the wit, for the greater hides the less. What's next? What's next? And more faults than hairs. Oh, uh, that were monstrous. All that were out. <laughs> and more wealth than faults. Well, that word makes the faults gracious. I will have her, and if it be a match, as nothing is impossible. What then? Why then? 
I will tell thee that thy master stays for thee at the north gate. For me? For thee? <laughs> I, who art thou? He has stayed for a better man than thee. And must I go to him? Thou must run to him, for thou hast stayed so long that going will scarce serve a turn. <laughs> oh, why didst thou not tell me sooner? Hox on your love letters. Oh. Uh, <laughs> now will he be swinged for reading my letter. An unmannerly slave that will thrust himself into the secrets. I'll after to rejoice in the boy's corrections. <laughs> Cithario, fear not, but that she will love you. Now Valentine is banished from her sight. Since his exile, she hath despised me most, forsworn my company, and railed at me that I am desperate of obtaining her. This weak impress of love is as a figure trenched in ice, which with an hour's heat dissolves to water and doth lose his form. A little time will melt her frozen thoughts, and worthless Valentine shall be forgot. <laughs> oh, how now, Sir Proteus? Is your countryman, according to our proclamation, gone? Gone, gone, my lord. Well, my daughter takes his going grievously. A little time, my lord, will kill that grief. So I believe, but Thurio thinks not so. Proteus, the good conceit I hold of thee, for thou hast shown some sign of good desert, makes me the better to confer with thee. Longer that I prove loyal to your grace, let me not live to look upon your grace. Thou knowest how willingly I would affect the match between Sir Thurio and my daughter. I do, my lord. And also, I think, thou art not ignorant how she opposes her against my will. <laughs> she did, my lord, when Valentine was here. Mm, aye. And perversely, she perseveres so. <laughs> what might we do to make the girl forget the love of Valentine and love Sir Thurio? The best way is to slander Valentine uh, with, with falsehoods, cowardice, and poor descent. Three things that women highly hold in hate. Aye, but she'll think that it is spoken hate. I, if it's his enemy, deliver it. Therefore, it must, with circumstance, be spoken by one who she esteemeth as his friend. Well, then you must undertake to slander him. And that, my lord, I shall be loath to do. Tis an ill office for a gentleman, especially against his very friend. Where your good word cannot advantage him, your slander never can endamage him. Therefore, the office is indifferent, being entreated to it by your friend. You have prevailed, my lord. If, if I can do it by, by aught that I can speak in his dispraise, she shall not long to continue to love him. But say this uh, weed for her love from Valentine, it follows not that she will love Sir Thurio. Therefore, as you unwind her love from him, let it should ravel and be good to none, you must provide to bottom it on me, which must be done by praising me as much as you in worth dispraise Sir Valentine. Yeah. And Proteus, we dare trust you in this kind because we know on Valentine's report, you are already love's firm votary and cannot soon revolt and change your mind. Upon this warrant, shall you have access where you with Sylvia may confer at, la at large, for she is lumpish, heavy, melancholy, and for your friend's sake will be glad of you, where you may temper her by your persuasion to hate young Valentine and love my friend. As much as I can do, I will effect. But you, Sir Thurio, are not sharp enough. You must lay, t must lay lime to tangle her desires by wailful, wailful sonnets, whose composed rhyme should be full fraught with serviceable vows. Aye, much is the force of heaven-bred poesy. <laughs> And say that upon the altar of her beauty, you sacrifice your tears, your sighs, your heart. Write till your ink be dry, and with your tears, moist it again, and frame some feeling line that may discover such integrity. For Orpheus's lute was strung with poets' sinews, whose golden touch could soften steel and stones, make tigers tame, and huge leviathans forsake unsounded deep uh, to dance on sand. After your dire lamenting el elegies, Visit by night your lady's chamber window with some sweet consort. 
To their instruments tune a deploring dump. The night's dead silence will welcome such a sweet complaining grievance. This or else nothing will inherit her. And this discipline shows thou hast been in love. And thy advice this night I'll put in practice. Therefore, sweet Proteus, my direction giver, let us into the city presently to sort some gentlemen well skilled in music. I have a sonnet that will serve the turn. Hmm. To give the onset to thy good advice. About it, gentlemen. We'll wait upon your grace till after supper and afterward determine our proceedings. Oh, even now about it. I will pardon you. <laughs> st st fellows, stand fast. I see a passenger. If there be ten, shrink not, but down with them. Stand, sir, and throw us that ye have about ye. If not, we'll make ye sit and rifle ye. Oh, sir, we are undone. These are the villains that all the travelers do fear so much. My friends. Uh, that's not so, sir. We are your enemies. <laughs> peace, peace. We'll hear them. I by my beard will be, for he is a proper man. <laughs> then know that I have little wealth to lose. A man I am crossed with adversity. My riches are these poor habiliments, of which, if you should hear disenfurnish me, you take the sum and substance that I have. Whither travel you? To Verona. Oh, whence came you? From Milan. How long ye sojourn there? Some sixteen months, and longer might have stayed, if crooked fortune had not thwarted me. What? Were you banished thence? I was. <laughs> For what offense? <laughs> For that which now torments me to rehearse. I killed a man, <sighs> whose death I much repent, but yet I slew him manfully in fight, without false vantage or base treachery. Why, ne'er repent it, if it were done so, uh, but were you banished for so small a fault? I was, and held me glad of such a doom. Have you the tongues? My youthful travel therein made me happy, or else I often had been miserable. By the bare scalp of Robin Hood's fat friar, this fellow were a king for our wild faction. We'll have him. Uh, sirs, a word. Master! Be one of them. It's an honorable kind of thievery. Peace, villain. Uh, tell us this. H have you anything to take to? Hmm? Nothing but my uh, fortune. <sighs> know then that some of us are gentlemen, such as the fury of ungoverned youth, thrust from the company of awful men. Myself was from Verona banished for practice and to steal away a lady and heir and near allied unto the duke. And I from Mantua for a gentleman who in my mood I stabbed unto the heart. Mm. And I for such like petty crimes as these, but to the purpose. For we cite our faults that they may hold excused our lawless lives. And partly seeing you are beatified with goodly shape and by your own report a linguist in a man of such perfection as we do in our quality much want <laughs> indeed because you are a banished man therefore above the rest we parley you are you content to be our general to make a virtue of necessity and live as we do in this wilderness huh? what sayest thou Wilt thou be of our consort? Say, are and be the captain of us all. We'll do thee homage and be ruled by thee. Love thee as our commander and our king. But if thou scorn our courtesy, thou diest. <laughs> thou shalt not live to brag what we have offered. I take your offer and will live with you, provided that you do no outrages on silly women or poor passengers. <laughs> No, we detest such vile base practices. <laughs> Come, go with us. Uh, we'll bring thee to our cruise and, and show thee all the treasure we have got, which with ourselves all rest at thy dispose. <laughs> uh, 
Already I have been false to Valentine, and now I must be as unjust to Thurio. Under the color of commending him, I have, I have access to the own love to prefer. My, I have access to mine own love to prefer. But Sylvia is too fair, too true, too holy to be corrupted with my worthless gifts. When I protest true loyalty to her, she twists me with my falsehood to my friend. When to her beauty I commend my vows, she bids me think about how I have forsworn in breaking faith with Julia, whom I loved. Notwithstanding all her sudden quips, the least whereof would quell a lover's hope. That spaniel like the more she spurns my love, the more it grows and fawneth on her still. Ah, here comes Thurio. Now we must now must we to her window and, and, and give some evening music to her ear. How oh, now, Sir Proteus, are you crept before us? I, gentle Thurio, for you know that I love that love will creep in service where it cannot go. I, but I hope, sir, that you love not here. Uh, sir, but I do, or else I would be hence. Who? Oh, Sylvia? I, Sylvia, for your sake. I thank you for your own. <clears throat> Now, gentlemen, let's tune and to it lustily a while. <laughs> now, my young guest, methinks you're Ollie Collie. I pray you, why is it? Marry my knight, because I cannot be merry. Oh, come, we'll have you marry. I'll bring you where you shall hear music and see the gentleman that you ask for. But shall I hear him speak? Aye, that you shall. That will be music. <laughs> ah, hark, hark. Is he among these? Aye, but peace, let's hear them. Who is Sylvia? What is she that all our swains commend her? Who, holy, fair, and wise is she, the heaven such grace did lend her, that she might be admired be? Is she kind as she is fair? For beauty lives with kindness, love doth to her eyes repair to help him in his blindness and being helped in habits there. Then to Sylvia, let us sing that Sylvia is excelling. She excels each mortal thing upon the duller dwelling to let to her, let us garlands bring. How now? Are you sadder than you were before? How do you man? The music likes you not. You mistake. The musician likes me not. Why my pretty youth? Plays false, father. How, out of tune on the strings? Not so, but yet so false that he grieves my very heart strings. You have a quick ear. Aye, I would I were deaf. It makes me have a slow heart. I perceive you delight not in music. Not a whit when it jars so. And hark what fine change is in the music. Aye, that change is the spite. You would have them always play but one thing? I would always have one play but one thing. But host, doth this Pr Sir Proteus that we talk on often resort unto this gentlewoman? I tell you what, Launce, his man, told me. He loved her out of all nick. Where is Launce? Gone to seek his dog, which tomorrow, by his master's command, he must carry for a present to his lady. Peace, stand aside, the company parts. So, Thurio, fear you not. I will so plead that you shall say my cunning drift excels. Where meet we? At St. Gregory's well. Farewell. Uh, madam, good evening to your ladyship. I thank you for your music, gentlemen. Who is it that spake? One lady, if you knew his pure heart's truth, you would quickly learn to know him by his voice. Sir Proteus, I take it. Sir Proteus, gentle lady, and your servant. What's your will? That I may compass yours. You have your wish. My will is even this, that presently you hie your home to bed. Thou subtile, perjured, false, disloyal man, thinks thou I am so shallow, so conceitless to be seduced by thy flattery? Let us deceive so many with thy vows, return. Return and make thy love amends for me by this pale queen of night, I swear. I am far for the granting thy request that I despise thee for thy wrongful suit. And by and by intend to chide myself for this, 
I spend in talking to thee. I grant, sweet love, that I did love a lady, but she is dead. Or false, if I should speak it, for I am sure she is not buried. Say that she be, yet Valentine, thy friend, survives. To whom I thou art witness I am betrothed, and art thou not ashamed to wrong him with thy impudency? I likewise hear that Valentine is dead. And so suppose am I, for his grave assured thyself my love is buried. Sweet lady, let me rake you from the earth. Go to thy lady's grave and call her thence, for at least in her sculpture thine. He heard not that. Madam, if your heart be so obdurate, Vouchsafe me yet your picture for my love, the picture that is hanging in your chamber. To that I'll speak, to that I'll sigh and weep, for since the substance of your perfect self is else devoted, I am but a shadow, and to your shadow I will make true love. Toward substance you would sure deceive it and make it but a shadow as I am. I am very loath to be your idol, sir, but since your falsehood shall become you well to worship shadows and adore false shapes, Send me in the morning and I'll send it. And so, good rest. As wretches have overnight that wait for execution in the morn. Host! Host! Host, will you go? Ah, oh, by my hildum, I was fast asleep. Pray you, where lies Sir Proteus? Ah, very at my house, trust me, I think tis almost day. Not so, but it hath been the longest night there that e'er I watched, and the most heaviest. This is the hour that Madame Sylvia entreated me to call and know her mind. There's some great matter she'd employ me in. Uh, Madam! Uh, Madam! Who calls? Your servant and your friend, one that attends your ladyship's command. Oh, Sir Eglamour, a thousand times good morrow. As many worthy lady to yourself. According to your ladyship's impose, I am thus early come to what service it is your pleasure to command me in. Oh, Eglamour, thou art a gentleman. Oh, think not I flatter, for swear I do not. O valiant, wise, remorse, remorseful, well accomplished, thou art not ignorant what dear God will bear in banished Valentine, nor how my father would enforce me marry vain Dorio, oh, with my very soul abhors. Myself has loved, and I have heard thee say, no grief did ever come so near to thy heart as when a lady and thy true love died upon whose grave thou vowest pure chastity. Sir Eglamour, I would to Valentine, to Mantua, where I hear he, make, he makes abode. And for the days are dangerous to pass, I do desire thy worthy company upon thy faith, thy honor repose. Or, urge not my father's anger, Eglamour, but think upon my grief, my lady's grief, and on the justice of my flying hence to keep me from my most unholy match, which heaven and fortune still rewards with plagues. Oh, I do desire thee even from a heart of full sorrows of the sea of sands to bear me company and go with me. If not, to hide what I have said to thee that I may venture to depart alone. Madam, I pity much your grievances, which since I know they virtuously are placed, I give a consent to go along with you, wreaking as little what betide me. As much I wish all good befortune you. When will you go? This evening coming. Where shall I meet you? At Friar Patrick's cell, where I do intend holy confession. I will not fail your ladyship. Good morrow, gentle lady. Good morrow, kind Sir Eglamour. Oh, come on. Come. Oh. Oh. When a man's Servant shall play the cur with him. Look you, it goes hard. Hmm? One that I brought up of a puppy? One that I saved from drowning when three or four of his blind brothers and sisters went to it? <sighs> I have taught him, even as one would say precisely, thus I would teach a dog. 
So I was sent to deliver him as a present to Mistress Sylvia from my master. And I came no sooner into the dining chamber, but he steps me to her trencher and steals a capon's leg. Oh, it is a foul thing when a cur cannot keep himself in all companies, hmm? Mm, I would have, as one should say, one that takes upon him to be a dog indeed, to be, as it were, a dog at all things. If I had not had more wit than he to take a, par a fault upon me that he did, I think verily he'd have been hanged for it. Sure as I live, he'd have suffered for it. You shall judge. He thrusts himself into the company of three or four gentlemen-like dogs under the Duke's table. He had not been there, bless the mark, a pissing while when all the chamber smelt him. Out with the dog, says one. Oh, what cur is that, says another. Whip him out, says a third. Hang him up, says the Duke. I, having been acquainted with the smell before, hmm? I knew it was crab. <clears throat> so goes, uh, so goes me to the fellow that whips the dogs. Uh, friend, quoth I, uh, you mean to whip the dog? Are you sure? <clears throat> Aye, Mary, I do, quoth he. You do him the more wrong, quoth I. Uh, Twas I did the thing you wot of. He makes me no more ado, but he whips me out of the chamber. How many masters would do this for their servant? Nay, I'll be sworn, I have sat in the stocks for puddings he hath stolen. Otherwise, he'd have been executed. I, I, I stood on the pillory for geese that he hath killed. Otherwise, he'd have suffered for it. Thou thinks not of this now, hmm? Huh? Nay, I remember the trick you served me when I took my leave of Madame Sylvia. Did I not bid thee mark me and do as I do, hmm? Once thou see, see me heave up my leg and make water with a gentlewoman's farthingale. Did thou ever see me do such a trick, hmm? Hmm? Sebastian is thy name. I like thee well and will employ thee in some service presently. In what you please, I'll do what I can. I hope thou wilt. How now, you horse and peasant? Where have you been these last two days loitering? Well, Mary, sir, I carried Mistress Sylvia the dog you bade me. And what says she to my little jewel? Well, Mary, she says your dog was a cur, and she tells you currish thanks is good enough for such a present. Hmm? But she received my dog. No, indeed, she did not. Here, I brought him back again. Oh. What, what didst thou offer her for, for this from me? Well, I, sir, the other squirrel was stolen from me by the hangman's boys in the marketplace. So then I offered her my own. It was a dog as big as Teddy yours, and therefore the gift the greater. Go get thee hence and find my dog again, or never return again into my sight. Away, I say, stayest thou to vex me here? <laughs> a slave that's still an end turns me to shame. Uh, Sebastian, I have entertained thee. Partly that I have in need of such a youth that can with some discretion do my business. For tis no trusting to yon foolish loud, but chiefly for thy face and thy behavior, which my augury deceive me not. Witness good bringing up fortune and, and truth. <laughs> um, therefore, no, 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 uh, therefore know thou that I will, uh, this, for this I entertain thee. Go, presently, uh, take this ring with thee, uh, deliver it to Madam Sylvia. She loved me well, delivered it to me. It seems you loved her, not her to leave her token. Uh, she is dead, belike? Uh, not so. I think she lives. Alas. Why dost thou cry alas? I cannot choose but pity her. Wherefore shouldst thou pity her? Because methinks that she loved you as well as you do love your lady Sylvia. She dreams on him that has forgot her love. You dote on her that cares not for your love. Tis pity love should be so contrary and thinking on it makes me cry, alas. Well, give her that ring and therewithal this letter. Uh, that's, that's her chamber. Tell my lady I claim promise for her heavenly picture. Your message done, hie home unto, unto my chamber where thou shalt find me sad and solitary. How many women would do such a message? Alas, 
or Proteus, thou hast entertained a fox to be the shepherd of thy lambs. Oh, that's poor fool, why do I pity him that with his very heart despiseth me? Because he loves her, he despiseth me. Because I love him, I must pity him. This ring I gave him when he parted from me to bind him to remember my goodwill. And now am I unhappy messenger to plead for that which I would not obtain, to carry that which I would have refused, to praise his faith, which I would have dispraised. I am my master's true confirmed love, but cannot be true servant to my master unless I prove false traitor to myself. Yet will I woo for him, but yet so coldly as heaven it knows I would not have him speed. A gentlewoman, good day. I pray you be my mean to bring me where to speak with Madam Sylvia. What would you with her, if that I be she? If you be she, I do entreat your patience to hear me speak the message I am sent on. From whom? From my master, Sir Proteus, madam. <sighs> he sends for you for a picture? Aye, madam. Ursula. Bring the picture here. Oh, Give your master this. Tell him it from me. One, Julia, this changing thoughts forget would better fit his chamber than his shadow. Madam, please you peruse this letter. Oh, pardon me, madam. I, I have uh, unadvised delivered you a paper that I should not. This is the letter to your ladyship. <laughs> I mean, let, let, let me look on that again. No, it may not be good, madam. <laughs> Pardon me. There, hold. I will not look at your master's lines. I know they are stuffed with protestations and full found oaths, which we, he will break as easily as I do tear this paper. Madam, he sends your ladyship this ring. The more shame from him that he sends it to me, for I have heard him say a thousand times as Julia gave him this as his departure. This false finger has profaned this wing, shall do his Julia so much wrong. She thanks you. What sayest thou? I thank you, madam, that you tender her, <coughs> poor gentlewoman. My master wrongs her much. Dost thou know her? Almost as well as I do know myself. To think upon her woes, I do protest that I have wept a hundred several times. Belike she thinks that Proteus hath forsook her, forsook her. I think she doth, and that's her cause of sorrow. Is she not passing fair? <laughs> she hath been fairer, madam, than she is. When she did think my master loved her well, she, in my judgment, was as fair as you. But since she did neglect her looking glass and threw her sun expelling mask away, the air hath starved the roses in her cheeks and pinched the lily tincture of her face that now she is become as black as I. How tall was she? About my stature. For at Pentecost, when uh, <clears throat> all our pageants of delight were played, our youth got me to play the woman's part, and I was trimmed in Madame Julia's gown, which served me as fit by all men's judgments, as if the garment had been made for me. Therefore, I know she is uh, about my height. And at <laughs> that time, I made her weep a good, for I did play a lamentable part. Madame, twas... Ariadne, passioning for Theseus' perjury and unjust flight, which I so lively acted with my tears that my poor mistress, moved therewithal, wept bitterly, and would I might be dead if I in thought felt not her very sorrow. She is beholding to thee, gentle youth. Alas, poor lady, desolate and left, I weep to think upon thy words. Oh, here, youth. Here is my purse. I give thee this for thy sweet mistress's sake that loves her. Farewell. And she shall thank you for it, if e'er you know her. A virtuous gentlewoman, mild and beautiful. I hope my master's suit will be but cold since she respects my mistress' love so much. Alas, 
how love can trifle with itself. Here is her picture. Let me see. <laughs> I think if I had such a tire, uh, this face of mine were full, as lovely as is this of hers. And yet the painter flattered her a litter, little, unless I flatter with myself too much. Her hair is auburn, mine is perfect yellow. If that be all the difference in his love, I'll get me such a colored periwig. Her eyes are gray as glass, and so are mine. Ay, but her forehead's low, and mine's as high. What should it be that he respects in her, but I can make respective in myself? This fond love were not a blinded god. Come, shadow, come, and take this shadow up, for tis thy rival. Oh, thou senseless form, thou shalt be worshipped, kissed, loved, and adored, and were there sense in his idolatry, my substance should be statue, statue in thy stead. I'll use thee kindly for my mistress' sake that used me so, or else by Jove I vow I should have scratched out your unseeing eyes to make my master out of love with thee. Well, the sun begins to gild the western sky, and now it is about well, the very hour that Sylvia at Friar Patrick's cell should meet me. She will not fail. For lovers break not hours, unless it is to become before their time. So much they spur their expedition. <laughs> ah, see, here she comes. Lady, happy evening. Amen, amen. Go on, good Eglamour. Out of the postern by the abbey wall, I fear I am attended by some spies. Fear not. The forest is not uh, three leagues off. If we recover that, we are sure enough. Sir Proteus, what says Sylvia to my suit? Oh, sir, I find her milder than she was, and yet she takes exceptions at your person. What? That my leg is too long? Uh, no, that it is too little. <laughs> <clears throat> oh, wear a boot to make it somewhat rounder. But love will not be spurred to what it loathes. <laughs> <clears throat> what says she to my face? Uh, she says it's a fair one. Mm, hey, then the wanton lies. My face is black. Uh, uh, but pearls are fair, and the old saying is, black men are pearls in beauteous ladies' eyes. Tis true, such pearls as put out ladies' eyes, for I had rather wink <laughs> than look on him. <laughs> How likes she my discourse? Uh, Ill, when, <clears throat> Ill when you talk of war. But, well, when I discourse of love and peace. But better indeed when you hold your peace. <laughs> What says she to my valor? Oh, sir, she makes no doubt of that. <laughs> she needs not when she knows it cowardice. What says she to my birth? <laughs> that, that, you, that you are well derived. True, from a gentleman <laughs> to a fool. <laughs> Considers she my possessions? Oh, I and p pities them. Wherefore? <laughs> that such an ass should owe them. <laughs> that, that they are out of by lease. Oh, here comes the Duke. How now, Sir Proteus? How now, Thurio? Which of you saw Eglamour of late? Not I. Not I. Saw you my daughter? Neither. Why then? She's fled unto that peasant Valentine, and Eglamour is in her company. Tis true. For Friar Lawrence met them both as he in penance wandered through the forest. Him he knew well and guessed that it was she, but being masked, he was not sure of it. Besides, she did intend confession at Patrick's cell this even, and there she was not. Oh, these likelihoods confirm her flight from hence. Therefore, I pray you, stand not to discourse, but mount you presently and meet with me upon the rising of the mountain foot that leads towards Mantua, whither they are fled. Dispatch, sweet gentlemen, and follow me. Why, this is to be a peevish girl that flies her fortune when it follows her. I'll after. 
More to be revenged on Eglamore than for the love of reckless Sylvia. And, and I will follow. More for Sylvia's love than hate of Eglamore that goes with her. And I will follow. More to cross that love than hate for Sylvia that is gone for love. Come, come, we must bring you to our captain. A thousand more mischances than this one have learned me how to brook this patiently. Um, bring her away. <laughs> Where's the gentleman that was with her? Being nimble-footed, he hath outrun us. But Moises and Valerius follow him. Go thou with her to the west end of the wood. There is our captain. <laughs> we'll follow him that's fled. The thicket is beset. He cannot scape. Come, I must bring you to our captain's cave. Fear not. He bears an honorable mind and will not use a woman lawlessly. Oh, Valentine, this I endure for thee. How use doth breed, breed a habit in a man. This shadowy desert, unfrequented woods, I better brook than flourishing peopled towns. Here can I sit alone, unseen of any, and to the nightingale's complaining notes, tune my distresses and record my woes. Oh, thou that dost inhabit in my breast, leave not the mansion so long tenantless, lest growing ruinous, the building fall and leave no memory of what it was. Repair me with thy presence, Sylvia. Thou gentle nymph, cherish thy forlorn swain. Hey, what's going hey, on? on? What howling and what stir is this today? These are my mates that make their wills their law, have some unhappy passenger in chase. They love me well, yet I have much to do to keep them from uncivil outrages. Withdraw thee, Valentine. Who's this comes here? Madam, this service I have done for you, th though you respect and not ought your servant doth to hazard life, and rescue you from him that would have forced your honor and your love. Thou'd save me for my meed, but for one fair look. A smaller boon than this I cannot beg, and less than this I'm sure you cannot give. How like a dream is this? I see and hear. Love, lend me patience to forbear a while. Oh, miserable and unhappy that I am. Unhappy you were, madam, ere I came. But by my coming, I have made you happy. By thy approach, thou makes me most unhappy. And me, when he approaches to your presence. Had I been seized by a hungry lion, I would have been breakfast to the beast rather than have false Proteus rescue me. Oh, heaven, be judge how I love Valentine, whose life is tender to me as my soul and as much, for as he cannot be, I do detest false perjured Proteus. Therefore, be gone, solicit me no more. What dangerous action stood it next to death? Would I not undergo for one calm look? Oh, tis the curse of love, and still approved, when woman cannot love where they are beloved. When Proteus cannot love where he is beloved. Read over Julia's heart, thy first best love, for though whose dear sake thou didst then rend thy faith into a thousand oaths, and all those oaths descended into perjury to love me. Thou well, hast no faith left now, unless thou hast two, and thou hast far worse than none. Better have none than plural faith, which is too much by one. Thou counterfeit to thy true friend. In love who respects a friend. Amen, but Proteus. <laughs> Nay, if the gentle spirit of moving words can no way change you to a milder form, I'll woo you like a soldier at an arm's end and love you against the nature of love. Force ye. To heaven. I'll force ye to my desire. Ruffian, let go that rude uncivil touch, thou friend of an ill fashion. A valentine. Thou common friend, that's without faith or love, for such is a friend now. Treacherous man, thou hast beguiled my hopes. Not but mine eye could have persuaded me. Now, I dare not say I have one friend alive. Thou wouldst disprove me. Who should be trusted when one's right hand is perjured to the bosom? Proteus. I am sorry, I must never trust thee more. 
but count the world a stranger for thy sake. The private wound is deepest. Oh, time most accursed. Amongst all foes, that a friend should be the worst. Ooh, my shame and guilt confounds me. Forgive me, Valentine. If already sorrow be a sufficient ransom for, for offense, I tender to hear. I do as truly suffer as e'er I did commit. Then I am paid. And once again, I do receive the honest. Who by repentance is not satisfied is nor of heaven nor earth. For these are pleased. By penitence, the eternal's wrath's appeased. And that my love may appear plain and free, all that was mine in Sylvia, I give thee. Oh, me unhappy. Look to the boy. Why, boy? Why wag? How now? What's the matter? Look up. Speak. Oh, good sir, my master charged me deliver a ring to Madame Sylvia, which out of my neglect was never done. Uh, where's that ring, boy? Here it is. This is it. Oh, uh, let me see it. What? Why, this is the ring I gave to Julia. Oh, cry you mercy, sir, I have mistook. This is the ring you sent to Sylvia. But how camest thou by this ring? A at my depart, I gave this unto Julia. And Julia herself did give it me, and Julia herself hath brought it hither. Oh, uh, Julia? Behold her that gave aim to all thy oaths and entertained him deeply in her heart. How oft hast thou with perjury cleft the root? Oh, Proteus, let this habit make thee blush. Be thou ashamed that I have took upon me such an immodest raiment, if shame live in a disguise of love. It is the lesser blot modesty finds women to change their shapes than men their minds. Than men their minds. Tis true, O heaven, were man but constant. If he were perfect, that one error fills him with the with faults. Makes him run through all the sins. Inconstancy falls off ere it begins. What is in Sylvia's face but may I spy more fresh in Julia's with a constant eye? Come, come, a hand from either. Let me be blessed to make this happy close. T'were pity, two such friends should be long foes. Bear witness, Evan, I have my wish forever. In thy mind. A prize! A prize! A prize! A prize! A prize. A prize. Forbear, a prize. forbear, I say! It is my lord, the duke. Your grace is welcome to a man disgraced. Banished Valentine. Sir Valentine. Yonder is Sylvia, and Sylvia's mine. Thurio, give back, or else embrace thy death. Come not within measure of my wrath. Do not name Sylvia thine. If once again, Milan shall not hold thee. Here she stands. Take but possession of her with a touch, I dare thee, but to breathe upon my love. Sir Valentine, I care not for her. I, I hold him but a fool that will endanger, that will endanger his body for a girl that loves him not. I claim her not. <laughs> oh, I claim her not. And therefore she is thine. The more degenerate and base art thou to make such means for her as thou hast done and leave her on such slight conditions. Now, by the honor of my ancestry, I do applaud thy spirit, Valentine, and think thee worthy of an empress love. Know then I here forget all former griefs, cancel all grudge, repeal thee home again, bleed a new state in thy unrivaled merit. To which I thus subscribe. Sir Valentine, thou art a gentleman and well derived. Take thou thy Sylvia, for thou hast deserved her. I thank your grace. The gift hath made me happy. I now beseech you, for your daughter's sake, to grant one boon that I shall ask of you. 
I grant it, for thine own, what e'er it be. These banished men that I have kept with all are men endued with worthy qualities. Forgive them what they have committed here and let them be recalled from their exile. They are reformed, civil, full of good, and fit for great employment, worthy Lord. Thou hast prevailed. I pardon them and thee. Dispose of them as thou knowst their deserts. Come, let us go. We will include all jars with triumph, mirth, and rare solemnity. And as we walk along, I dare be bold with our discourse to make your grace to smile. Uh, what thinks you of this page, my lord? Oh, uh, I think the boy hath grace in him. <laughs> he blushes. <laughs> I warrant you, my lord, more grace than boy. What mean you by that saying? <laughs> Please you, I'll tell you as we pass along that you will wonder what hath fortune. Come, Proteus, tis your penance but to hear the story of your loves discovered. That done, our day of marriage shall be yours. One feast, one house, one mutual happiness. All right, come on back on, everybody. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Uh, next week, we're going to be doing another show, so be sure to tune in next Saturday.